Welcome back. Now, a recent Peter Maritzburg Economic Justice and Dignity Household Affordability Index shows that the average cost of household food basket is now 4,917 rand and 42 cents. Now, it says that food prices uh, at the till are up nearly 12% in one year. That's from January last year until now. And according to the Agricultural Business Chamber, a load shedding is placing even more pressure on the agricultural industry and that directly through additional costs incurred to run generators. Now the Association of Southern Africa Sugar estimates that load shedding will increase the South African food cost in general by 20% in the next few months. Now to help us unpack uh, what, to what extent this will affect you and I at the tills in the few months uh, ahead of us, we are joined via Zoom by Theo Bossoff, who is the CEO of the Agricultural Business Chamber, uh, Agbiz. Uh, Theo, thanks so much for speaking to us. Welcome to Morning Live. Thank you, good morning. So just from your members, you know, farmers' perspective, what are they uh, telling you at the moment regarding load shedding and how it's actually affecting their businesses? Yes, it has a tremendous impact. Um, I think not simply on the farming community. Remember, because the agri-food value chain stretches all the way from inputs, including farmers, um, cold storage, processing, all the way up to the retail space. So essentially, the additional cost for load shedding um, you know, does affect the profitability and and and, and the balance sheet of, of each one of those entities. Uh, so if you look at where it, it has the, the biggest impact, um, you know, on the input side, of course, in, a lot of energy is required, for instance, to um, to manufacture animal feeds, to manufacture fertilizer or uh, certain chemical products, uh, especially chemical fertilizers. Um, on farm specifically, you know, where the biggest challenges are currently faced is in the irrigation sector. So typically um, on a normal year, but of course it depends on whether on, on what the, the rainfall does, but on a typical year, about 20% of, of our maize, 15% of soybean and 34% uh, of sugarcane, and then the vast bulk of, of the fruit and vegetables are under irrigation. Now irrigation typically is uh, accounts for the, you know, the biggest portion of electricity spend, um, and where there's interruptions, that's where the biggest challenges is. Uh, currently, with the load shedding, I think it's especially the, you know, aside obviously the additional um, cost of, of diesel to run generators, as you've mentioned, it's a stop start nature of load shedding which poses a huge challenge. Um, you know, to, to secure food safety and quality, you, you need uninterrupted um, supply. Uh, for instance, on a farm level, again, you know, with irrigation, once a center pivot stops, it, it, um, it, 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 takes, it takes an hour or two to get it going again. So, the stop start nature of it is a real challenge. So. Uh, currently, I think the biggest concern from primary agriculture side is having sufficient um, continuous electricity to be able to at least in the, uh, go through one proper irrigation cycle in a 24 hours uh, space. Other industries, of course, it affects them very differently. If you look at the, um, the poultry industry, they specifically, of course, um, power is required to, uh, you know, to, keep the, to keep the animals cold and, 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 and the risk of, of excessive heat is certainly great there. Also, um, of course, availability of of, uh, of animal feeds, uh, which also affects them. In the dairy industry, for instance, you'll find that typically, of course, after cattle is milked, uh, you know, the milk needs to be reduced to five degrees Celsius to try to keep it um, uh, any bacteria, anything from forming. Um, and then you even get uh, further level process processing, especially if one's making formula, for instance, you know, to to powder the milk. That that's very energy intensive sectors that are directly affected. Uh, cold storage, absolutely vital as well. I mean the if, if you think about trying to get produce from all over the country onto the supermarket shelves and even onto supermarket shelves overseas as well as many other export destinations, an uninterrupted cold chain is absolutely vital uh, to try to retain that freshness. And that's really where a lot of the, the challenges are being posed by, by the current load chain. And of course, you know, all of that, and uh, there's, uh, one would imagine, as you say, Theo, a lot of pressure on uh, irrigation. Uh, but then to add to the woes that ESCOM brings, we've also had a very hot and dry January. Uh, is that uh, adding uh, any more pressure to an already, you know, exacerbated situation? It certainly is. Um, if you look at dry, what's known as dryland production, which typically rain-fed agriculture, uh, there, the pressure is slightly less, simply because we, we've had two exceptional rain years, three exceptional rain years, actually. So the soil moisture was uh, was already you know, at, at such high levels that uh, we believe that you know, the rain-fed agriculture should still be okay. However, irrigation agriculture 
um, because it's so concentrated, you know, one does need uninterrupted supply, consistent supply. So, so that is certainly where, where, where one of the biggest challenges, challenges are. And the past uh, three weeks or so of extremely hot and dry conditions in the northern regions uh, certainly has accelerated you know, or, or compounded this challenge. I do think, though, um, it, it's a little bit too early to tell what the damage would be. Uh, we have sent out a, um, you know, on the request of, of the Minister of Agriculture, you know, we, we are part of a task team and we've, we've tried to get the evidence base in terms of what the real impact can be. Um, and I think with respect, you know, any sort of prediction in terms of how, you know, what what percentage food prices uh, as a whole would go up, I think it's too early to make this kind of prediction simply because, um, you know, all, all indications are in the month of February, you might have cooler weather, higher rainfall. Um, so the damage to those crops, whether that's permanent or, or, whether, or whether they can recover, will have a huge impact in terms of availability. The additional costs, you know, that the value chain is carrying with, with uh, um, backup generation diesel, of course, you know, that's something that has to be factored into it. But I think once one talks about uh, real price spikes will, will be brought up, you know, if, and whether or not that will be brought on by potential shortages, it's simply too early to tell. One, once, one will only know later on in the season, closer, especially, for instance, with the maize and soya, where the harvest season takes place um, around May. Only at that stage one, will one really be able to tell, um, wh you know, whether, the, whether, whether these blackouts um, coupled with the inability to irrigate, coupled with the, with the hot and dry conditions in January, how big the impact really was. Now, Theo, what sort of conversations are you having with government, uh, not only about uh, the impact of load shedding, as you've spelled out for us, but also where the solutions could possibly come from? Absolutely. You know, the, the impact is relatively easy to gauge. It, the solutions are, of course, uh, significantly more complex. The root cause of, of the challenge is, is something that obviously does, doesn't fall within um, agriculture specifically, but there are various um, government, organ excuse me, business organizations where we're also involved trying to provide support to government with increasing a generation capacity. But on a more practical level, and, and this is where um, you know, the Department of Agriculture has also taken the lead in terms of calling together a task team uh, of private sector role players as well as government role players and researchers is to try and find practical solutions for the agricultural sector. Um, ultimately, you know, load shedding most likely all indications are that at some level at least is here to stay for the for the foreseeable future. So the aim is is to currently um, make load shedding more predictable. So in, in other words, in a manner that whilst it's a given it will take place, one can look at shifting the schedules around. Um, you know, to make it slightly more predictable and more man manageable for um, for the agricultural sector. Just uh, by means of an example, of course, um, you know, with most of the economy operating during the daytime, that that's when the peak demand would be. So to try to help balance demand, um, it's entirely possible, you know, that the, the irrigation sector can operate during night shifts, and there's already a lot of that taking place and, and movements more towards moving that, because that'll help balance the demand, I think, on the grid. But at the same time, of course, it's from purely from an agricultural point of view, it's better to irrigate at night in any event when you've got such a hot and dry conditions. Uh, looking at the processing side, which is also you know, absolutely vital, um, uh, you know, converting agricultural produce you know, into, into actual food products that, that you can have in your shelves, they are trying to align a load shedding schedules with your shift schedules. In other words, perhaps having um, a longer periods of uh, interrupted power and, then, and as long as longer periods of uninterrupted power and that way you can arrange your your shifts and, and your operations that require power uh, along the lines of you know of when you do have power provided you have that certainty the challenge of course the fundamental challenge will always be it, it, that uh, you know companies aren't aren't alone in the grid um, they obviously share connections share substations with uh, you know both farmers as well as agribusinesses that are embedded in in local municipalities and rural towns is that they do, of course, share the same infrastructure as other town, uh, excuse me, as other businesses, as households. So trying to reach some sort of agreement uh, with, with these entities to see the benefit of having an altered schedule or even um, to the extent that it's technically possible to invest in infrastructure so that businesses can isolate themselves from the grid and have a different load shedding schedule, longer stages on, longer stages off than, for instance, a residential household might. And then what was the uh, reception from government to those suggestions, Theo? That's far very good. Um, I think there's a, there's a genuine understanding of the, the challenge we face. Of course, um, you know, the impact on, on the economy is very clear. The impact on, on um, and the potential impact that it could have on employment is very clear. But the additional element that agriculture brings in, of course, is food security, which is absolutely vital for the country. 
Uh, so there's so there's certainly a, a very clear understanding of the importance of it, but practically rolling this out um, is a challenge because you know each area, each district in the country will have its own dynamics, um, also based on infrastructure. As I mentioned, many of these companies are not simply ESCO direct ESCO clients, so a top-down decision won't necessarily be able to to resolve all the issues. Many of many of the companies are deeply embedded in municipal grids. Um, in other words, then uh, various tiers of government. The different municipalities, for instance, would also have to weigh up and, and balance the, the differing requests from different, uh, yeah, from communities, from residential areas, from different businesses, and how they prioritise that and how they try and reconcile the different, uh, the different requests is certainly a big challenge. So the reception has been good, but the implementation is, is I think, not so straightforward, and that's perhaps why it's taking longer than, um, you know, than perhaps we would have liked. And, you know, we talk about uh, the pressures that uh, this will have on consumers uh, as a result of the knock-on effect of what uh, the farmers and uh, the sector as a whole would be uh, feeling, Theo. Uh, I have to ask you about the increase that NERSA has granted and what has the industry's response been to that. And did you also highlight that particular issue in your discussions with government? Absolutely. I mean, the, the recent increase, I think, um, you know, of course, it is a shock and it will be, will, will be felt, but, uh, but that's been the trend for, for the best part of at least five or six years, where we've had double-digit increases. So the cost of electricity is definitely going up, and I think uh, in the foreseeable future, the, you know, there's, there's not much likelihood that it, uh, that, 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 that will stop. Um, so, so it has to be part of the discussion. Um, the, different, um, the different types of electricity products, for instance, and a rural flex which a lot of primary agriculturists, in other words, farmers also um, have. It's, it's an additional amount, additional tariff, of course, because the infrastructure is laid out for a long distance, specifically to service, you know, one or two clients. So I think the impact is even worse in agriculture than perhaps it is in the rest of the economy in that regard, or the tariffs would be higher. Uh, ultimately, though, you know, both for security of supply as well as long-term balancing the costs, uh, those sectors of the, um, you know, of the agriculture value chain that can invest in their own generating capacity um, are, Many of them have already done so. Many of them are looking at, at it very seriously. And some of the discussions taking place is also, of course, to try and find out how to make that easier and more affordable for them to do so. Uh, the likes of, I mean, of course, many offices, many homes are going the route of, of rooftop solar. Uh, you know, to some extent, areas within the value chain that can assist uh, where your electricity consumption is, is relatively constant, for instance, with for cold storage. But there will always be challenges um, you know, agro-industrial clients, for instance, uh, soybean crushing plants, um, edible oil manufacturers, uh, sugarcane mills, for instance, that, uh, you know, where renewable energy or solar or battery might not necessarily be able to um, to meet that need. And that's why one's looking at other forms of embedded generation, biomass uh, combustion, for instance. So if, so effectively, I think it's a, it's a given and it's a known that, that this will take place, but to try to buffer the consumer from um, increased uh, increased costs, certainly these companies are looking at alternative means. And to a large extent, um, you know, and, and to a large extent, actually the full costs of the increased inputs, not just electricity, but the increased diesel costs, increased fertilizer costs, everything that we've seen in the last couple of years hasn't been passed on directly to the consumer. A lot of the agribusinesses and food, pro food companies have actually buffered the consumer to some extent by taking a bit of a knock. The sustainability of that, of course, you know, is, is in question. So the, the food increases that we have seen already in the last year hasn't been as high as international norms. Indications of load shedding, it might well put us up to international norm, norms or even exceeding international law, norms. That's because it's difficult to absorb those costs. But uh, of course, in a society like South Africa, where you have poverty, where you have inequality to the extent that we have um, slight increases in the food, food uh, price, even if it doesn't meet international, even if it's less than international norms, will be felt certainly by low-income households. So definitely companies are doing everything they can to try and prevent that from happening. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, appreciating that, uh, Theo, just very briefly, how soon will the consumer actually uh, know of or feel that knock-on effect of uh, the load shedding and other factors on food prices and inflation? It, it would differ completely from product to product. Um, certain products have a shorter turnaround time or lifespan than others. Uh, your basic food staple, such as, of course, um, maize meal, for instance, as I mentioned, that one would only have to know what um, at the end of a season, judging by the, the full harvest we have and what impact this had. So that would that would roughly be in you know, probably in the winter months. Um, other products, for instance, poultry, um, 
uh, you know, any dairy products, as I mentioned, that of course is a much shorter life, lifespan. So there, the you know the the price increases might already be be felt. Theo, thank you so much uh, for your time this morning. I really appreciate it. And uh, speaking to us there about uh, the knock-on effect of what uh, some of the um, value chain in the community of producing food for this country is actually going through and how that's going to impact you and I at the tills. Theo Bosov is the CEO of the Agricultural Business Chamber, Agbis, helping us to unpack what those effects will be and uh, what they're likely to do to our food prices in the next few months.